All right. Well, this morning we are going to look at one of my favorite stories, favorite um, parables to preach on. And I will tell you right up front, though, as we do that, because it's so familiar to us, it's often easy for us to just think we know what's there. And let me just challenge you to just let yourself be absorbed in the story today. And as we begin, though, let me ask you a question. What is your view of the Father? How do you see your Heavenly Father? You know, it's important for us to note that we see our Heavenly Father through a number of lenses. The first lens, of course, that we see Him through is our earthly Father. And as we see ourselves through Him is how we often see God. And even if you had the very best of human fathers, your human father was still human. He was still fallen. He was still broken. And as a result, we see God wrongly as we look through the lens of our earthly father. We often also see God through the lens of our religious upbringing. You know, I grew up in a context that maybe the best description of it is a song that was in our hymnal that always just really bugged me. And it was a song, and the title of it was, There's an All-Seeing Eye Looking Over You. Now, I think the original author's intent for the song was a caring that God is looking over you, always taking care of you. But I can remember as a child and as an adolescent having this image of this giant eyeball constantly hovering over me, waiting for me to make a mistake so that he could let me have it for my mistakes. That was a faulty lens of God. We also have lenses of God based upon things in our culture and our world. And so this morning I want to challenge you to allow this story of the Father in Luke chapter 15 to redefine and reshape your view of the Father. Many people call this the parable of the prodigal son. Um, some people I think more accurately call it the parable of the prodigal sons because guess what? The older brother is just as lost as the younger one. But I think most accurately, this parable is not about the sons. This parable is the parable of the Father. And so let's look at this parable bit by bit. So verse 11, it says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, even to our ears today, this demand, give me my share, sounds like pure arrogance. But one of my favorite authors on the parables is a man by the name of Kenneth Bailey. And Dr. Kenneth Bailey spent his entire life living amongst and studying the peasant communities of the Middle East. And listen to what he says about the son's request. He writes, for over 15 years, I have been asking people of all walks of life, from Morocco to India and from Turkey to the Sudan, about the implication of a son's request for his inheritance while his father is still living. The answer has always been emphatically the same. The conversation runs as follows. Has anyone ever made such a request in your village? Never could anyone ever make such a request. Impossible. Well, if anyone ever did, what would happen? Well, his father would beat him, of course. Why? This request means he wants his father to die. That's how all peasant people of the Middle East hear this Terrible. Hear this request. Dad, I wish you were dead so that I could have your things now. Aside from this parable in all Middle Eastern literature from ancient times to the present, there is not one single case of any son asking for his inheritance 
from his living father. This request, as Jesus tells it, was shocking to his audience. And the demand is one that says, Dad, I wish you were dead. Think about it also this way. This isn't the son of an abusive father. As we see in this story, the son grows up with an incredible father. Yet he wishes his father were dead so that he could have his inheritance now. In the Middle Eastern world, the father is expected to explode and discipline the boy for the implications of his demand. Yet the father in Jesus' story does just the opposite. He gives the young man what he asks for, and the boy in turn sells his land to get the cash for what he wants to do. Look at verse 13. Not longer, long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country and squandered his wealth in wild living. Okay, what I want you to notice here is that the biggest problem is not the money lost, but the relationships that he destroys. Okay, this story is more about the division, the schism between a father and a son, and also between two brothers. And there are many implications to the son's actions. First, think about this. By selling the property and leaving, he is refusing to ever dwell with his brother and father again. He, in essence, is cutting all ties, burning the bridges, and saying, I wish you were both dead, but since you aren't, I'm going to live as if you were. And notice also that he sold his land in a hurry. The NIV translates it as not long after that, or it might possibly be better translated, not many days later. Now, what you need to understand is, in the Middle East, the sale of property, land especially, <coughs> ordinarily drags on for ages. Yet he gets it done quickly. Well, question. If you want to sell something quickly, what do you have to do? You sell it cheap. No matter what the market is, no matter what's going on, if you want to sell something quickly, if you sell it at a you know, dime on the dollar, you can have buyers quick. Well, question, why would the son sell it quickly? Why would he sell it cheap? Because that's how much of a hurry he is to get away from his father and his brother. Remember also that in his culture, land is passed from generation to generation to generation. This land the boy sells wasn't just his father's, it was his grandfather's and his great-grandfather's and ancestors before him. Think of the insult of him not only selling it in the first place, but selling it quickly and cheaply. And then notice the disposal of that. Notice the inheritance wasted. Look at the end of verse 13. He set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. He takes his money and he wastes it. Think of that. Half of a family fortune wasted on wine and women and surface friends who disappear the moment the cash is gone. Think about it. Land that had been in the family generation after generation sold for less than what it was worth and then the money wasted in a relatively short amount of time. What a waste. And then notice the consequence of where it leaves him. Notice the rock bottom he hits in verse 14. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now again, this would be bad enough if it were you and it were me. But remember, this is a good Jewish boy from a good Jewish family. And guess what is the most detestable thing on the earth to Jews? Pigs. So here he is, he lives like a king for a short amount of time, and now he's living in squalor, wishing that he could eat the very pods that the pigs that he's been hired to take care of eat. That's a very hard bounce on bottom. And the hard bounce on bottom brings him to a very good decision. The decision to return home. Look at verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and yet here I am starving to death? He thinks back to his father. He remembers what a good man he is. He says, my father takes better care of his hired men than I'm being taken care of. Verse 18. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. Now many people read this and say, oh, the son has come to a place of repentance. I don't think so. Maybe he's on the path to repentance. But question, what is he sorry for at this point? Well, he's sorry he's lost the money. He's sorry that he has to live, and feed, leave, live with and feed pigs. He's sorry that he hit rock bottom. He's sorry for the consequences that he's facing. But question, is he truly broken over his sin? Is he broken over wishing his father was dead? Is he broken over the severing of the relationship with his father and his brother? No, there's no hint of sorrow for those things. He's like we often are when we are caught and we're facing consequences. We're very sorry about the consequences because they hurt, they're painful. But are we sorry on a heart level of what we've done? In fact, notice even in his speech, notice his attempt to maintain his pride. Think about it this way. If the younger son stays at home, if he returns and the father allows him to stay, he in essence becomes a freeloader to his brother. Because after all, who owns, whose is everything that's left? It's the older brothers. But, he thinks, as a hired servant, I could work hard, I could save my money, and maybe I could repay my debt. Do you see his pride? He's still trying to save himself. He doesn't want any grace. Notice also that his prepared speech doesn't even ask his father for a job. He doesn't say, okay, I'm going to go and turn to my father and say, Father, could you please hire me? No, it demands his father hire him. So after bouncing hard on bottom... He decides to go home and, in essence, work off his debt from his father. And what's the insinuation of that? The insinuation is, I will work my way back. I will still do it myself. Make me like one of your hired men. The term hired men here was a specific term for the lowest of three classes of servants. Hired men is a term for those who live in the village and then come and work for a daily wage. So here's what he's thinking. 
as a hired servant, I can live in the village and not have to face my older brother all the time. Again, remember, everything left in the estate legally belongs to his brother now. His father has already divided it. The law, however, said that the father, even if he divided his estate, was entitled to live on the estate and provide for whoever he chooses. So if this son decides to come home and his father decides to let him stay, then he's freeloading off of his brother. She says, no, I will be a hired man. I will live in the village. I will not live under my brother's roof. But now he's got another problem. And this problem is the deterrent of the villagers. You see, one problem that he has no solution for is the fact that by leaving the way he did, he has made himself an outcast in the community. In their culture, in the Middle Eastern world, in these shame-based cultures, when you disgrace yourself and your family you also disgrace your entire community. So the boy knows that upon his arrival, he will be subject to the verbal and even physical abuse of the community. Kenneth Bailey tells us that he would know that when he begins to walk into the village, the young boys will run and tell everyone that he has come crawling back. And they will come and tell everyone what he looks like and what his clothes are like and that he's obviously lost everything. Then these boys will circle him and others will join them and they will mock him, ridicule him, throw stones at him and likely even beat him because of the shame that he has brought to his family and his village. But he has a difficult choice. I either stay where I'm at and starve to death, or I face the village. You know, it's like one of the statements that Debbie and I have made for many years in our recovery ministry is that until the perceived level of the pain of staying is greater than the perceived level of the pain of change, we stay where we're at. He's at a place where he says, my hunger is so great, I'm willing to even face the ridicule, mocking, and beating of my community in the hopes that my father will save me. His impetus is starvation. He is so hungry that he longs to eat the pods the pigs are feeding on. So the boy begins the long journey home. And can you imagine how difficult every step was? Every step that brings him closer and closer to facing the village as the failure that he has become. But then look at what happens in verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, His father saw him. Now just pause here for a second. What does that tell us that his father saw him when he was a long ways off? It tells us that the father was watching for him. Day after day, he was scanning the horizon, looking for his son that was lost. His father saw him. And was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Notice the deliverance of his father running to him. Notice the boy never faces the villagers. Notice that before he even makes it to the village, the father sees him coming and runs to him. He beats the villagers to him. His father ran to him. And again, here's a place where in our culture we miss a big part of the point here. 
Because, you know, if you're driving Sunday mornings, you drive, you'll see old men jogging down the streets, right? I look at them and go, what's wrong with you? What are you thinking? All right? My knees don't do that. But running is something that we do in our culture a lot. In Jesus' day, a nobleman would never think about running. Part of it was, think about it in this context. Um, They wore long flowing robes. Ladies, how difficult is it to run in a long dress? Same was true for a nobleman in Jesus' day. For a nobleman in Jesus' day to run, he would have to reach down between his legs, pull his robe up over his waist, strap his belt around it, expose white bony knees that had not seen the light of day in 30 plus years, and look like a fool in order to run. It was considered a disgrace in Jesus' day for a nobleman to run. Aristotle said, great men never run in public. Yet why does this father run? To intervene between the son and the villagers. He runs to his son to show the village and to show his son his full acceptance. The very disgrace the son was about to receive deservingly, the father takes upon himself undeservingly. The father runs to him, and then if that wasn't enough, notice what else he does. Because you see, it would be only appropriate at this point for the son to fall on his knees in humble subjection, kiss his father's feet. But instead, the father grabs his son and kisses him. And the verb tense that Luke uses here tells us that the father kissed him over and over and over again. His father ran to him, took him in his arms, embraced him, held him up, kissed him and kissed him and kissed him. And that, my friends, is what brings the true repentance of verse 21. It says, Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I believe that this is the point where the son finally repents. I've sinned against heaven and against you. Notice that he says nothing about becoming a hired man. Some have said it's because the father interrupted him. I don't think so. I mean, yes, I think the father interrupted him, absolutely. But I think it's because he is blown away by his father's love. I think the son finally realizes that his sin is so much greater than squandering his inheritance with wild living. And I think he finally realizes that his sin is the separation he has made from his father. And in that place, he finally sees that there is nothing that he can do to fix it. You know, think about it, folks. How many times in our messes do we waste so much effort and energy trying to fix it? And our attempts to fix the mess don't even put a band-aid on over it. The son realizes there is nothing he can do to fix it. He could never work long enough to repay his debt. I mean, even if he earned enough money to pay back the financial part of his debt, he could never pay back the debt that he created in telling his father, I wish you were dead, and I'm burning bridges, and I'm leaving you. When he sees his father run to him, 
when he experiences his father's embrace, he finally is ready for grace. And notice the complete restoration in verse 22. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Notice several things here. First of all, notice the father orders his servants to dress his son as a king. Question, whose robe is the best robe? It's the father's robe. The ring that's mentioned here is the father's signet ring. And the sandals that he tells them to put on him are a sign of him being a free man in the house rather than a servant in the house. Servants were barefoot. The free men, the father and his son could wear sandals. In other words, he says, my son now has full, complete status as son. He is 100% restored. But then second, notice the father orders the servants to prepare a feast. Now folks, you need to understand, if you're going to have a, couple, a few people over, you kill a chicken. If you're going to have a small party, you, you know, if you're going to have a decent sized party, you might kill a lamb. What does this father do? He says, kill the fatted calf. What that means is that means let's have a party for hundreds. Why? Because the father wants to make it clear, not just to his son, but to both his sons, to all his servants, and to everyone in the village, that his son is to be accepted by all with the same open arms with which he accepted him. So what's the implication? The implication is, you are my son, and I love you. You are my son, I love you. I love you because I love you, because I love you, because that's who I am. <coughs> and folks if we can ever let this parable really sink in if we can realize that no matter what we've done no matter where we've been no matter how many times we've blown it that every single time that we turn around and begin moving back towards the Father. This is how our Father always responds. Always. Because that's who He is. Let's pray. Father, we come to You this morning and we... Just admit we struggle with seeing you, knowing you this way. That most of us have heard this parable all our lives. And yet, Lord, we struggle to really let this story of the Father who runs to us sink in. And so, Lord, I just ask that this morning... that you would do your miraculous work of your Holy Spirit to open our hearts to let this truth sink in. That in all our mess, in all our shame, in all our squandering of everything that's yours, in all the many ways that we have told you I don't want anything to do with you and all the ways that we've told your other sons and daughters I don't want anything to do with you either that you still run to us 
You still embrace us. You still love us right where we are at every single time. And so, Lord, I just ask that you help us understand what it means that you are a God who runs to us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to close with an old classic song. It's Benny Hester's When God Ran. And it's going to take me a second to work upside down and navigate. Actually, the easiest thing to do is unplug. Maybe. I just want to to let this song sink in. For those of you watching on YouTube, just do a search for Benny Hester's In God Ran.